While most Americans thought the United States had fulfilled its manifest destiny by spreading across North America, it was William Henry Seward, Secretary of State to both Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, who articulated a far more grandiose vision of the American Empire. Although he failed more often than he succeeded, he set his sights on acquiring Hawaii, Canada, Alaska, the Virgin Islands, Midway Island, and parts of Santo Domingo, Haiti, and Colombia. A lot of this dream would actually come true. But while Seward dreamed, the European empires acted. Britain led the way in the last 30 years of the century, gobbling up 4.75 million square miles of territory, an area significantly larger than the United States. As the Romans did, Britain believed her mission was to bring civilization to mankind. France added 3.5 million square miles. Germany, off to a late start, added 1 million. Only Spain's empire was in decline. By 1878, European empires and their former colonies controlled 67% of the Earth's land surface. And by 1914, an astounding 84%. By the 1890s, Europeans had carved up 90% of Africa. The lion's share claimed by Belgium Britain, France, and Germany. The United States was anxious to make up for lost time, and although empire was a hostile concept to Americans, most of whom had come from immigrant stock, it was now an era dominated by the robber barons. In particular, an aristocracy known as the 400, with their huge estates, private armies, legions of employees, men like J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and William Randolph Hearst held enormous power. The capitalist class, haunted by visions of the revolutionary workers who formed the Paris Commune of 1871, conjured up similar visions of radicals upsetting the system in the United States. What's the use of talking? Talking's done nothing. The pamphlets are no good either. What we want is action. Yeah. Yeah. action. We'll tear up the streets of Paris. If they've got bayonets, we've got knives. These radicals, or communards, were also called communists almost 50 years before the Russian Revolution of 1970. Jay Gould's 15,000-mile railroad empire epitomized the worst of the robber barons. He was perhaps the most hated man in America, having once boasted that he could hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. When the financial panic of Black Friday hit Wall Street, it triggered the nation's worst depression to date. Mills, factories, furnaces, and mines shut down everywhere in large numbers. Four million workers lost their jobs. Unemployment reached 20%. The American Railway Union, headed by Eugene Debs, responded to layoffs and pay cuts by George Pullman's Palace Car Company and shut down the nation's railroads. Federal troops were sent in on the side of the railroad magnates. Dozens of workers were killed, and Debs spent six months in jail. The socialists, trade unionists, and reformers at home protested that capitalism's cyclical depressions resulted from the underconsumption of the working class. In his pioneering photography, Jacob Rees shocked the nation by first documenting the misery of New York City's poor. Working class leaders were arguing for redistributing wealth at home so that working people could afford to buy the products of America's farms and factories. But the 400, the oligarchs, responded that this was a form of socialism. They said there could be a bigger pie for all and argued that the U.S. had to compete with 
foreign empires and dominate the trade of the world so that foreigners would absorb America's growing surplus. The profit for them was clearly abroad in trade. The chief prize was China. To tap this vast market, the U.S. would need a modern steam-powered navy and bases around the world to compete with the British Empire with its major concession at the port of Hong Kong. Russia, Japan, France, and Germany were all clawing to get in. Businessmen began pressing for a canal across Central America which would help open the door to Asia. In this climate of global competition, in 1898, the United States annexed Hawaii. Cuba, less than 100 miles from the shores of Florida, had revolted against the corruption of Spanish rule, and the Spanish reacted by incarcerating much of the population in concentration camps where 95,000 died of disease. As the fighting increased, powerful bankers and businessmen like Morgan and the Rockefellers, who had millions invested on the island, demanded action from the president to safeguard their interests. President McKinley sent the USS Maine to Havana Harbor as a signal to the Spanish that the US was keeping an eye out on American interests. On a night in February 1898, with the tropical heat more than 100 degrees, Maine was suddenly blown up, killing 254 seamen, supposedly sabotaged by the Spanish. The U.S. yellow press, embodied in mogul William Randolph Hearst, led a crazed tabloid reaction and created a vigilante climate for war. We have no secrets from our readers, Mr. Bernstein. Mr. Thatcher is one of our most devoted readers. He knows what's wrong with every copy of the Inquirer since I took over. Read the cable. Girls delightful in Cuba, stop. Could send you prose poems about scenery, but don't feel right spending your money. Stop. There is no war in Cuba. Signed, Wheeler. Any answer? Yes, dear Wheeler, you provide the prose poems. I'll provide the war. The journals cry, remember the main, to hell with Spain. Millions read it. Convinced that Spain, this decaying Catholic power, was capable of any evil trick to preserve her empire. When McKinley declared war, Hearst took credit. How do you like the journal's war? Often remembered by Teddy Roosevelt's symbolically colorful charge up San Juan Hill, the Spanish-American War was over in three months. Secretary of State John Hay calling it a splendid little war. Out of almost 5,500 U.S. dead, fewer than 400 died in battle, the rest succumbing to disease. 16-year-old Smedley Darlington Butler lied about his age and signed up with the Marines. He would become one of America's most famous military heroes, winning two Medals of Honor in a career that would shadow America's destiny to come. With victory, American businessmen swept in, grabbing assets where they could, essentially making Cuba into a protectorate. United Fruit Company locked up two million acres of land for sugar production. By 1901, Bethlehem Steel and other U.S. businesses owned over 80% of Cuban minerals. More than 70 years later, in 1976, an underreported official investigation by the Navy found that the most probable cause of the sinking of the Maine was a boiler which exploded in the tropical heat causing the ship's ammunition store to explode. As with Vietnam and the two Iraq wars, the U.S., basing its reaction on false intelligence, went to war because it wanted to. In the glow of victory, however, the U.S. found herself with a much bigger problem. She'd acquired from the Spanish a gigantic but ramshackle landmass in the Far East, the Philippine Islands which were viewed as an ideal refueling stop for China-bound ships. As in the invasion of Baghdad in 2003, the fighting there began successfully. Commodore George Dewey had destroyed the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay in May 1898. One anti-imperialist noted, Dewey took Manila with the loss of one man, 
and all our institutions. The Anti-Imperialist League was founded in Boston in 1898, seeking to block U.S. annexation of the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Its ranks included Mark Twain, who famously asked, Shall we go on conferring our civilization upon the peoples that sit in darkness, or shall we give these poor things a rest? President McKinley did not share that mindset, opting finally for annexation. There was nothing left for us to do but to take the Filipinos and uplift and civilize and Christianize them, and by God's grace do the very best we could by them, as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. McKinley was ignoring reality. Under the fiery leadership of Emilio Aguinaldo, the Filipinos had established their own republic in 1899 after being freed from Spain, and like the Cuban rebels, expected the United States to recognize them. They had overestimated their ally, and now they fought back. After one protest, Americans lay dead in the streets of Manila. America's yellow press cried out for vengeance against the barbarians. Torture, including waterboarding, became routine. The insurgents, or our little brown brothers as they were nicknamed, were pumped full of salt water until they swelled up like toads to make them talk. One soldier wrote home, We all wanted to kill niggers. This shooting human beings beats rabbit hunting all to pieces. It was a war of atrocities. When rebels ambushed American troops on the island of Samar, Colonel Jacob Smith ordered his men to kill everyone over the age of 10 and turn the island into a howling wilderness. More than 4,000 U.S. troops would not return from this guerrilla war, which lasted three and a half years. 20,000 Filipino guerrillas were killed, and as many as 200,000 civilians died, many from the cholera. But because of distorted press reports, mainland Americans comforted themselves with the thought that they had spread civilization to a backward people. In China, a similar yearning for independence led to the homegrown Boxer Rebellion of 1900. Nationalist-minded Chinese rose up with fury to murder missionaries and throw out all foreign invaders. McKinley sent 5,000 American troops to help the Europeans and the Japanese defeat the rebels. Lieutenant Smedley Butler was in the invading force leading his Marines into Beijing where he saw firsthand the way the victorious Europeans treated the Chinese. He was disgusted. Thus, as in 2008, the 1900 American election took place with U.S. troops tied down in numerous countries. In this case, China, Cuba, and the Philippines. And yet, McKinley, basking in the glow of victory over Spain, beat Bryan by a wider margin than he had in 1896. Socialist Eugene Debs barely registered with under 1%. Americans had clearly endorsed McKinley's vision of trade and empire. My fellow citizens, recent events have imposed upon the people. At the height of his popularity, McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist in 1901. The assassin had complained about American atrocities in the Philippines. The new president, Theodore Roosevelt, an even more unabashed imperialist, continued his policies. They're gonna build that canal in Panama City! I'll dig it with my own hands if I have to! And Roosevelt, orchestrating a revolution in Panama, a province of Colombia, signed a treaty with the newly created Panamanian government to lease the canal zone, receiving the same rights of intervention the U.S. had forced upon Cuba. The canal was built with great difficulty and finally opened in 1914. In the years to follow, U.S. Marines were repeatedly sent in to protect U.S. business interests in what were now called banana republics. Considered backward and in need of strong rule by sometimes brutal dictators able to enforce U.S. business interests on the workers and a resistant peasantry. It is my policy to protect American citizens and American interests whenever, wherever they are threatened. Cuba, Honduras, Nicaragua, 
the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Panama, Guatemala, Mexico. U.S. occupations often lasted for years, sometimes for decades. No one had more firsthand experience intervening in other countries than Smedley Butler, now a major general in the Marine Corps. Adored by his men, they called him Old Gimlet Eye after a wound sustained in Honduras. And at the end of his long and highly decorated service, he reflected upon his years in uniform. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service as a member of this country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commission ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. Like all the members of the military profession, I never had a thought of my own until I left the service. I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefits of Wall Street. The record of racketeering is long. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar earners in 1916. In China, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. Looking back on it, I feel I could have given Al Capone a few hints. Best he could do is operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. His overall outspokenness over the years would cost Butler dearly when he was passed over as commandant of the Marine Corps, which he now left in 1931 under a cloud of contention. War is a racket, is what Butler was saying, and World War I was among the most dismal episodes in human history. One of the lesser known facts of this story is that on the eve of World War I, the banks of the British Empire were in crisis. Britain's economic model of cannibalizing the economies of increasing parts of the globe in order to survive and not investing in its own homegrown manufacturing was failing. Cycles of depression came and went. In contrast, the newly unified German Empire was leading the nations of continental Europe in a new system away from free trade to protectionist measures that encouraged the growth of a domestic industrial base not as dependent on colonization. Germany was competing in the production of steel, electrical power, chemical energy, agriculture, iron, coal, and textiles. Its banks and railroads were growing, and in the battle for oil, the newest strategic fuel that was necessary to power modern navies, Germany's merchant fleet was rapidly gaining on Britain's. England, now heavily dependent on oil imports from the US and Russia, was desperate to find potential new reserves in the Middle East, which were part of the tottering Ottoman Empire. And when the Germans began building a railroad to import this oil from Baghdad to Berlin through their alliances with this Ottoman Empire, Britain was deeply opposed. The interests of their nearby Egyptian and Indian empires were threatened. Enormous unrest in the Balkans, particularly in Serbia, helped block the Berlin-Baghdad Railroad from completion. In fact, it was a minor affair in Serbia that finally set off the chain of events of World War I when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife were assassinated on the streets of Sarajevo in the baking summer of 1914. The situation deteriorated quickly in a series of complex alliances between competing economic empires led to the greatest war yet in human history. The war was a slaughter from beginning to end on a level incomprehensible to the public. In the first Battle of the Marne in 1915, the British, the French, and the Germans 
suffered 500,000 casualties each. The war lasted beyond all expectations. In one brutal single day at the Somme, Britain lost 60,000 dead. France and Germany suffered almost a million casualties during the Battle of Verdun in 1916. Repeatedly ordered to charge into the teeth of German machine guns and artillery, France ultimately lost half of its young men between the ages of 15 and 30. Germany first used poison gas successfully at the Battle of Ypres in April 1915, blanketing French troops along four miles of trenches. The Washington Post reported that French soldiers were driven insane or died from agonizing suffocation. Their bodies turned black, green, or yellow. The British retaliated with gas at Los in September, only to see the wind shift and the gas blown back into the British trenches, resulting in more British casualties than German. In 1917, Germany unleashed even more potent mustard gas weapons against the British again at Ypres. The novelist Henry James wrote, The plunge of civilization into this abyss of blood and darkness is a thing that so gives away this whole long age during which we have supposed the world to be gradually bettering. Woodrow Wilson was the embodiment of the Henry James pre-war ideal of hope and civilization. First elected president in 1912, he echoed most Americans' sympathy for the Allies. Britain, France, Italy, Japan, and Russia against the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey. But he didn't join the war explaining, We have to be neutral since otherwise our mixed populations would wage war on each other. He won re-election in 1916 with the slogan, he kept us out of war, but he would soon reverse himself. The old anti-imperialist William Jennings Bryan, now serving as Wilson's Secretary of State, tried to maintain America's sense of neutrality in the war, but Wilson rejected his efforts to bar U.S. citizens from traveling on ships of countries at war. Britain, which for nearly a century now controlled the Atlantic with its superior naval power, had launched a blockade of Northern Europe. Germany retaliated with a highly effective U-boat campaign that seemed to be able to tilt the balance of power on the high seas. In May 1915, a German U-boat sank the British liner Lusitania leaving 1,200 dead, including 120 Americans. It was a shock. There were calls for America to go to war. But despite initial disclaimers, it was found that the ship was indeed in violation of neutrality laws and carrying a large cargo of arms to Britain. Bryan demanded that Wilson condemn the British blockade of Germany as well as the German attack, seen both as infringements of neutral rights. When Wilson refused, Bryan resigned in protest. Wilson was increasingly coming to believe that if the U.S. did not join the war, they would be denied a role in shaping the post-war world. And in January 1917, he dramatically delivered the first formal presidential address to the Senate since the days of George Washington. He called for peace without victory based on core American principles of self-determination, freedom of the seas, and an open world with no entangling alliances. The centerpiece of such a world would be a league of nations that would enforce the peace. Wilson's idealism has always been suspect because it seemed to be consistently undermined by his politics. American neutrality in this war was in effect more a principle than a practice. J.P. Morgan, along with Rockefeller of Standard Oil, had been one of the two titans of American finance since the Civil War. He died in 1913, but his son, J.P. Morgan Jr., effectively served as America's banker to the British Empire between 1915 and 17, when the U.S. entered the war. 
Initially, the United States would not allow American bankers to float loans to the belligerents, knowing that this would undermine America's stated neutrality. But in September 1915, in his first term, Wilson reversed himself. And in that month, Morgan floated a $500 million loan to Britain and France. By 1917, the British War Office had borrowed close to $2.5 billion from the House of Morgan and other U.S. banks on Wall Street. Only $27 million had been loaned to Germany. By 1919, after the war, Britain found itself owing the U.S. a staggering sum of $4.7 billion, $61 billion today. Morgan also became the sole purchasing agent for the British Empire in the U.S., placing some $20 billion in purchase orders and taking a 2% commission on the price of all goods, favoring friends like DuPont Chemical, Remington, and Winchester Arms. Socialist Eugene Debs had consistently urged workers to oppose the war, observing, Let the capitalists do their own fighting and furnish their own corpses, and there will never be another war on the face of the earth. Whether for financial or idealistic reasons, in April 1917, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war, saying, the world must be made safe for democracy. Six senators voted against it, including Robert La Follette of Wisconsin and 50 representatives in the House, including Jeanette Rankin of Montana, the first woman ever elected to Congress. Opponents attacked Wilson as a tool of Wall Street. We are putting a dollar sign on the American flag, charged the respected Senator George Norris of Nebraska. Opposition ran deep, but Wilson got his wish. Yet, despite government appeals for a million volunteers, reports of the horrors of trench warfare dampened enthusiasm, and only 73,000 men signed up in the first six weeks, forcing Congress to institute a draft. As 1918 dawned, it looked as if the Central Powers might indeed win the war and defeat the Allies, which threatened to leave the U.S. bankers in a huge financial hole. America rallied with patriotic liberty bond drives, and many of the nation's leading progressives, John Dewey, Walter Lippmann, took Wilson's side. It was the Midwestern Republicans like La Follette and Norris who understood that the war was a death knell for meaningful reform at home. And Congress demonstrated this in passing some of the most repressive legislation in the country's history, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, which curbed speech and created a climate of intolerance towards dissent. University professors who opposed the war were either fired or cowed into silence. Hundreds were jailed for speaking out, including industrial workers of the world leader, Big Bill Haywood. Eugene Debs protested repeatedly and was finally arrested in June 1918, saying, Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that is war in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. Before being sentenced, he eloquently addressed the courtroom. Your Honor, years ago, I recognized my kinship within all living beings. And I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. While near there is a soul in prison, I am not free. The judge sentenced Debs to 10 years in prison. He served three from 1919 to 21. With Wilson's permission, the Department of Justice destroyed the IWW, the Wobblies, while some Americans marched off to war to the strains of the hit song, Over There. Over there. Over there.
Wobblies responded with a parody of onward Christian soldiers titled Christians at War, which ended with History will save you that pack of goddamn fools. 165 of their leaders were charged with conspiring to hinder the draft and encourage desertion. Big Bill Haywood fled to revolutionary Russia. Others followed. German Americans were singled out with particular animosity. Schools, many of which now demanded loyalty oaths from teachers, banned German from their curricula and orchestras, dropped German composers from their repertoires. Just as French fries would later be renamed Freedom Fries by congressional xenophobes furious at French opposition. While most Americans thought the United States had fulfilled its manifest destiny by spreading across North America, it was William Henry Seward, Secretary of State to both Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, who articulated a far more grandiose vision of the American Empire. Although he failed more often than he succeeded, he set his sights on acquiring Hawaii, Canada, Alaska, the Virgin Islands, Midway Island, and parts of Santo Domingo. Haiti and Colombia. A lot of this dream would actually come true. But while Seward dreamed, the European empires acted. Britain led the way in the last 30 years of the century, gobbling up 4.75 million square miles of territory, an area significantly larger than the United States. As the Romans did, Britain believed her mission was to bring civilization to mankind. France added 3.5 million square miles. Germany, off to a late start, added 1 million. Only Spain's empire was in decline. By 1878, European empires and their former colonies controlled 67% of the Earth's land surface. And by 1914, an astounding 84%. By the 1890s, Europeans had carved up 90% of Africa. The lion's share claimed by Belgium, Britain, France in this war than the Russians, by 1.7 million dead and almost 5 million wounded. Those who survived were living in a new world order. Britain, France had been badly weakened. The German Empire had collapsed. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, more than 50 years old, was over, resulting in the chaotic restructuring of Eastern Europe. And the great polyglot Ottoman Empire of Arabs, Turks, Kurds, Armenians, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, which had lasted for 600 years, now crumbled. In Russia, a mysterious group of revolutionaries known as the Bolsheviks, promising land, bread, and peace, took power in October 1917 in the ruined realm of Tsar Nicholas II, who had lost the army in the slaughterhouse of World War I, and with it, the trust of both soldiers and workers who were fed up by the brutality of this war. The Bolsheviks were deeply inspired by a German-Jewish intellectual, Karl Marx, calling for the social and economic equality of man. And they immediately set out to reorganize Russian society at its roots, nationalizing banks, distributing land and estates to the peasants, putting workers in control of factories, and confiscating church property. And in March 1918, eight months before the end of World War I and almost Two months before the U.S. troops saw action in France, Vladimir Lenin signed a peace treaty with Germany, pulling Russian troops from the war. Woodrow Wilson and the Allies were furious. The Bolsheviks were vowing to destroy the old secretive ways of capitalism and empire building, throwing them into the dustbin of history. They were promising incredibly world revolution, and there were uprisings in Budapest, Munich, Berlin. The remaining European empires, Belgium, Britain, and France, trembled 
Not since the French Revolution some 125 years before had Europe been so profoundly shaken and changed. Inspired by the Russian Revolution, a wave of hope gripped colonized and oppressed peoples on six continents. In one brazen act, Lenin's Red Guard ransacked the old foreign office and published what was found, a web of secret agreements between the European allies, dividing the post-war map into exclusive zones of influence. Much as the United States would react to the WikiLeaks publications of its diplomatic cables in 2010, the Allies were outraged by this violation of the old diplomatic protocol, which now exposed the hollowness of Woodrow Wilson's call for self-determination after the war. Wilson, appalled as he was by Lenin's actions, was already aware and disgusted by what the French and British had secretly agreed to. But nonetheless, he sent American troops into battle on behalf of the French and British Empire. The conservative counter-revolution against the Bolsheviks was ferocious. Separate armies were attacking the new Russia from all directions. Native Russians and Cossacks, the Czech Legion, Serbs, Greeks, Poles in the West, the French in Ukraine, and some 70,000 Japanese in the Far East. In reaction, Lenin's co-revolutionary leader, Leon Trotsky, ruthlessly put together a Red Army of approximately five million men. The outspoken but influential ex-lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, said Bolshevism ought to be strangled in its cradle. An estimated 40,000 British troops arrived in Russia. Some deployed to the Caucasus to protect the oil reserves at Baku. Though most of the fighting would be over by 1920, pockets of resistance persisted until 1923. In a foreshadowing of what was to come some 60 years later, Muslim resistance in Central Asia lasted into the 1930s. Wilson initially hesitated to join the invading forces, rejecting the notion of overthrowing the new regime but ended up sending more than 13,000 American troops and helping arm and finance the anti-Bolshevik forces. Robert La Follette in the Senate deplored this action as a mockery of Wilson's idealism. To deny the counter-revolutionaries their major rallying point, in July 1918, in a devastating shock to the waves of pre-war old Europe, Lenin ordered the execution of the Tsar and his family. Lenin's secret police, the Cheka, were successful in mopping up many of the Bolsheviks' remaining enemies. Tales of the Red Terror, often exaggerated, were carried west. And when Wilson allowed U.S. troops to remain in Russia until 1920, it deeply poisoned the beginnings of any U.S.-Soviet relationship. The U.S. would not recognize Soviet Russia until Franklin Roosevelt's presidency in 1933. When he arrived in Europe in December 1918 for the Paris Peace Conference, Wilson was mobbed by adoring crowds, two million in Paris. When he entered Rome, the streets were sprinkled with golden sand as per ancient tradition. The Italians proclaimed him the God of Peace. 27 nations met in Paris on January the 12th, 1919. Wilson was a star. The world was going to be remade. It was indeed his most glorious moment in time. But as with Alexander in Babylon, Caesar in Rome, and Napoleon on the frontiers of Europe, a zenith of success had been reached. Wilson considered himself the personal instrument of God, and the peace conference was the crowning moment of his divine mission. In reinterpreting World War I ideologically along the lines of the wars of the French Revolution a century earlier, Wilson was claiming that this was a war to change humanity, a war to end all war. In an address to the United States Senate that year, he was to say, 
America's world row has come by no plan of our conceiving, but by the hand of God. It was of this that we dreamed in our birth. America shall indeed, in truth, show the way. In Wilson's view, America's manifest destiny was no longer a case of continental expansion. It was now a divinely ordained mission to humanity. This idea of saving humanity became essential to the American national myth in all subsequent wars. In an attempt to counter Lenin's revolutionary appeal, Wilson had, one year earlier, while the war was still raging, announced a set of international democratic principles, including free trade, open seas, and open agreements between nations that would become the basis of a new international peace. He called this the 14 points. The Germans surrendered on the basis of Wilson's 14 points, believing he would guard them from dismemberment by the Allies. They even changed their form of government, adopting a republic and opposed the Kaiser, who soon disappeared into exile. The United States was the new dominant force in the world. Although it had been a debtor nation in 1914, owing $3.7 billion, by 1918 it had become a creditor nation and was owed $3.8 billion by its allies. Nonetheless, the old multinational empires that had stood since the Middle Ages had no interest in Wilson's idealism. They wanted revenge and money and colonies. British Prime Minister Lloyd George noted that in the United States, not a shack had been destroyed. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, whose country had lost over one million soldiers, commented, Mr. Wilson bores me with his 14 points. Why, God Almighty has only 10. As a result of this attitude, several of Wilson's ill-defined 14 points would be removed from the Treaty of Versailles. Britain, France, and Japan divided the former German colonies in Asia and Africa, and paying lip service to the promised self-determination of the Arabs who had revolted against the Ottoman Empire, Winston Churchill and the Foreign Office divided that empire, creating new client states such as Mesopotamia, which was arbitrarily renamed Iraq. The old empires sanitized their actions by calling these new colonies mandates, and Wilson went along with it by arguing that the Germans had ruthlessly exploited their colonies, whereas the Allies had treated their colonies humanely, an assessment that was greeted with incredulity by the inhabitants of French Indochina. Ho Chi Minh, as a young man, rented a tuxedo and bowler hat and visited Wilson carrying a petition for Vietnamese independence. Like other third world leaders in attendance, Ho would learn that liberation would only come through armed struggle, not Woodrow Wilson's largesse. Although Lenin was not invited to Paris, Russia's presence cast a pall over the meetings. Lenin called Wilson a smoother over. He said, only genuine revolutionaries may be trusted. And as a delegate sat, communists took over Bavaria and Hungary and threatened Berlin and Italy. Lenin's call for a worldwide revolution was heard in the Third World in lands as far away as China and Latin America. Focused intently on his League of Nations, which he considered essential to preventing future war, Wilson failed to secure the kind of non-punitive treaty he publicly advocated. As Britain and France perversely applied Wilson's concept of self-determination against Germany, leaving millions of citizens stranded outside their new shrunken border. In its famous war guilt clause, the Treaty of Versailles placed the entire blame for starting the war on Germany and not the other colonial empires and required them to pay almost $33 billion to the Allies in war reparations, more than double what Germany expected. Prominent in Wilson's delegation was Thomas Lamont, the House of Morgan's leading partner upon whom Wilson relied. Lamont would make sure that Germany's payments to Britain and France would in turn allow them to repay the fortune they had borrowed on Wall Street to survive the war. In reality then, the entire new structure of international finance was built on the shaky foundation of 
of German war reparations, which would shortly contribute to a German economic collapse out of which Adolf Hitler would emerge. In years to come, the U.S. Congress would investigate the machinations of the so-called merchants of death. These were the industrialists and bankers who made obscene profits from the war. No one was convicted, nothing proven, but there remained a lingering populist feeling of distrust for World War I. Many, including congressional leaders, felt that millions had been sacrificed in a financial boondoggle for bankers and other war profiteers. The bitterness of this feeling was intense. Wilson came home to a country where American labor was rife with discontent and desperate for reform. In the year 1914, by example, as many as 35,000 workers were killed in industrial accidents. Over four million workers went on strike in 1919 alone. 365,000 steel workers, 450,000 miners, 120,000 textile workers. In Seattle, a general strike shut down the entire city. In Boston, even the police force walked out, leading the Wall Street Journal to warn Lenin is on the way. President Wilson, in response, wanted to kill off Lenin's message. Communism was a European madness, not an American one. In the so-called Red Summer of 1919, even race riots exploded out of control in Chicago and several other cities, including Washington, D.C. Federal troops arrived to restore order. President Wilson continued to travel the land, arguing that the U.S. needed to ratify the Versailles Treaty and establish the League of Nations to ensure his vision of world peace. Progressive Republicans denounced Wilson's League of Imperialists, bent upon defeating revolutions and defending their own imperial designs. Critics demanded changes, but no modifications were acceptable to Wilson. His health began to suffer, and in a final speech in Pueblo, Colorado in September 1919, he collapsed. He suffered a severe stroke and was incapacitated for the rest of his life. In November 1919, Federal agents were unleashed under Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer in the first of a series of raids on radical and labor organizations across the country. The operation was run by the 24-year-old director of the Justice Department's Radical Division, J. Edgar Hoover. Estimates vary from three to 10,000 dissidents were arrested many incarcerated without charges for months. Hundreds of foreign-born radicals, including Russian-born Emma Goldman, were deported. As civil liberties were increasingly abused, identifying dissent with un-Americanism, 